continuity. Here's the layman's term definition of continuity. A function is continuous if it has no holes, breaks, or asymptotes. That's pretty much it. If you can graph it by not picking your pencil off the paper, you would say it's continuous. So that, that's what we're talking about. So uh, continuity says curves continuous. If it doesn't have any holes or breaks or asymptotes, Now, would you like me to give you a more precise definition than that? Holes, breaks, and asymptotes? Yeah. Yeah. That's understandable, right, though? Hopefully. It doesn't have any holes in it. It doesn't have a gap. And it doesn't have any asymptotes in it. That, that if you don't have those things, then it's continuous everywhere. If you do have those things, it would be continuous most places, just not at those specific points. Here's what continuity is mathematically, though. So more specifically, a function is continuous if Three things happen. First, oh, sorry, you know what? And let me say, uh, add a point. I need to add that on there. Otherwise, it's not going to really make a lot of sense. So, continuous. Add a point C. If. So, continuous at point C. If. Firstly, I hope this makes sense to you. Firstly, if the function is defined at that point, this has to exist. How can you have continuity if the point doesn't exist? Does that make sense to you? So it's, it, we'd say it's continuous at some point, C, if you can plug in C and you get out of point. That's what that says in English. So if f of C is defined. You plug in C, you get out of point. That's what that means. Number two. Number two, the limit has to exist at that point. So that means that the function is from, the bo from both sides around point C. Remember point C is like your input, right? Around point C, the function is going, no matter what, to the same spot. Does that make sense? It can't go like this. That wouldn't be continuous because you have that jump. You with me? So the limit has to exist and around that point C. So not only does C have to be fine, have to be defined, the limit of f of x as x approaches C must exist <coughs> and thirdly this thing has to equal this thing Function f is continuous at point A or at point C if three things happen. Firstly, the point exists. What this means again, last time, is if you plug in C, you get something out. Secondly, the limit exists. That means the function is going to the same place from left to right as you approach C. Thirdly, where you approach is this point. That's what that says. Where you approach is that point. So it means the function is going to a point, the point exists, and it's right between where the, the function is going. Okay, that's, that's what that says. If that happens, what that means is you go along your function, you get to a point, you fill in the point, you keep on going. Make sense? So there's no hole there. There's no asymptote. Um, and that, that also works for asymptotes, right? Even the limit existed in infinity, there's no point at infinity saying you would have a break. You can't make that little jump. 
Let me give you some pictorial examples on, on what this looks like. You ready for it? So. <coughs> Let's try to apply this, the question I'm going to ask you to, to this over here, what I told you about continuity. So number one, uh, does the point exist at x equals c? Is there a point there? No. So already we fail, number one. That right there says you're not going to be continuous because you fail, number one. Uh, is number two satisfied, though? Does the limit exist? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, it's going to the same value from left to right. So limit's there. But when you ask this question, is the limit equal to the function value? No, because it, it, there's a hole. It's not even there. So there is no point. Number one fails, and therefore number three fails. This is not continuous. So we'd say it's not continuous, wait, all over the place? Is it not continuous all over the place? Not continuous at C. At C. Is it continuous here? Yes. Absolutely. Actually, most of this function is continuous. It's just that little point that's not continuous. What this is called when you have a hole. Remember talking about holes? It's called a removable discontinuity. So this is not continuous at C. And we call it a removable discontinuity. What that basically says is you have a hole. A removable discontinuity is a discontinuity that you could fill in with a single point. Let's try another one. Let's check our three necessities for our limit to uh, for our function to be continuous at a point C. Firstly, is number one satisfied? Do we have a point at C? Yes. yes we do. Is number two satisfied? Does a limit exist? No. Limit exists says we're going to the same spot. It means it has to look like this to get it. Does it look like that? It looks like this, right? That's a problem. So does this side meet up with this side? If it doesn't, then the limit doesn't exist. So is number two satisfied? No. If number two is not satisfied, Number three can't possibly be satisfied because this is non-existent. So this fails continuity. So we'd say, yeah, this is not continuous at C, for sure, it's not continuous. Uh, but is it a removable discontinuity or not? No, even if I put another point up there, it's not going to make a difference, right? I'm not going to be able to continue my function with one single point. This one I could. Just put it right there, you, you're, you're good to go. It's like uh, filling in the hole. But here you can't do that. This is not removable. This is like a jump continuity. You're jumping from point to point, or from uh, one part of the function to another. I don't know what, if they call it a jump continuity in the book. It might. But that's what you're, you're doing is you're jumping. So we'll say that's a jump discontinuity. This one's removable discontinuity. How about this one? Let's check our three statements. Number one, is the function defined at point C? Is the function defined at point C? Yeah. Really? Defined? You can plug in C and get a point? No. Uh, yeah. What if I did this? We said, okay. There. Is the function defined at point C? Yes. Yes, it is now. There is a point. You plug in C, you get that specific point. You with me? Does the limit so number one is satisfied. Is number two satisfied? Does the limit exist? Are you going to the same spot from left to right? Going to infinity. Yes, limit exists. So number one is satisfied. 
and number two is satisfied. Would you agree with that? Yeah. This is why we need number three. Is number three satisfied? Does the limit equal the value of the function? The limit equals infinity. The value of the function equals this right here. Are those the same thing? No. So number three fails. So we've had a case where number one fails, where number two fails, and now where number three fails. So you, you see those, those examples, yes? This is called infinite discontinuity. So we'll say this is at infinity, or at infinite. <laughs> Hey, what about this one? What if I put a point, if I, if I put a point up here but it didn't close in the circle, would that be continuous at that point? No, it would still jump. That's still a removable discontinuity though if I redefine the point. So if I say, okay, you know what, I'm just going to move this point from here to here, redefine it, then we'd say that's still a removable discontinuity. How many people understand the different terms that we, that we have here? So basically we have three different uh, kinds of discontinuities. Those that have asymptotes, those that are, are jumps, and those that are holes. We mostly deal with these two. This one would be like a piecewise function. We, we are mostly over here when we're dealing with rational functions. Uh, that's usually what we have. Stuff we can cross out. What should we do about that? Stuff we can cross out uh, where we get rid of the, the problem in our limit and stuff that we can't cross out where we do a sign analysis test. I've showed you both of those things before. Do you remember them? All right. Shall we check? Let's check some functions to see if we can tell whether they're continuous or not. Are there any questions about our, our necessities for continuity here or these graphs over here? Okay. Yes? When you said that, when you have the point on the first one, sure. uh, below the hole, yeah. and you said you could move it up to the hole, but it did. We'd have to, well, not move it up to the hole. We're redefining. We're saying, this would be a piecewise function right now, or some very special function. We redefine this in some way so that this is no longer here, but it fits in that hole. That's called the removal of discontinuity. We've removed this point and placed it in the hole, basically. We've redefined it somehow. But keep in mind, you are redefining your function just a little bit. Okay, so we're going to ask, are these following functions continuous at x equals 2? Let's see. So first one, how about f of x? Is that continuous at x equals 2? Basically, can you, is it defined at x equals 2 is what you would check first. Is it defined at x equals 2? Can you plug in 2 and get something out? Mm -mm. So that would fail. This is not continuous. In fact, if you remember, we've, I think we've had this problem one very, very similar to it. What this is, by the way, uh, can you determine whether that's a hole or an asymptote? Could you figure that out? Why is it a hole? Because it's cold. <coughs> it does, yeah. This is x plus 2, x minus 2. So your function is really x plus 2. Do you see where the x plus 2 is coming from? Use your difference of squares, cross out your x minus 2, you're going to get x plus 2. That's really what this function is. It, well, at least that's what it looks like, is x plus 2. Only when I plug in 2, so if 
I cross those out, I'd say, well, yes, f of x equals x plus 2. But I hope you remember what I told you about domain. Domain has to be from the original function, not your brand new function. Remember we, when we talked about that? So x can't be defined at 2. We tried that up here. It didn't work. What this says is, if I were able to plug in 2, if I were able to plug in 2, how much would I get out of it? 4. Four. Now, am I able to plug in 2? So what that says is, if I were able to plug in 2 and I got out 4, I have a whole at 2 comma 4. Can you make that jump? You okay with that idea? That says, all right, normally I would be this function, but I know I can't plug in 2. That means I can't get out the number 4. I can't get out that value. Just to reinforce the concept, would this be continuous at x equals 1? How about x equals 5? Yeah. How about any other point besides 2? Yeah. Absolutely. We're just talking about 2 right now. Now let's move over to the next function. Uh, these look confusing, but here's all this says. This says, for everywhere except 2, you're now this thing. We, st we have that here. But now at 2, I have a point 3. So let's check the continuity now. Is number 1 satisfied? Is the function, uh, is the function defined at my point x equals 2? Yeah. Absolutely, it's right here. That's that's the definition. Uh, is does a limit exist? Does the limit exist? Yes, the limit exists. The limit exists. But now this point is three. So when I go over two, it says I'm at three. That's what this one is right now. So it says is the is the function defined at the point? Absolutely. Does the limit exist for my function around that point? Yes, it does. Is the limit equal to the function value? So, is this one continuous? No. 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 Everywhere else? Yes, but not here. So, no. 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 Would that be a jump or an discontinuity? This would be a removable discontinuity. I'm going to show you why right now. Okay. So, firstly, we tried a point, right? We have this function, and we have this hole in it. So, if I cover that up, this is my original f of x. True? I tried to plug in a point. Did I make it fit right? No, it doesn't fit right. Let's try the next one. A of x says, okay, now, it looks almost identical to g of x, except instead of having it, uh, x equals 2 defined at 3, we have x equals 2 defined at 4. Tell me, does the 4 fill in the hole? Yes. So by making a piecewise function and defining just one single point, we go, oh, well, how about this? Is the function defined at that point? Yes, it is. Does the limit exist? at that point. Yes, it does. Is the function equal to the limit? Yes. That meets all three qualifications for having continuity of that point. Therefore, we say yes. That's a removable discontinuity. It means you, you identify one point that fills in the hole. <laughs> okay. If a function is continuous at each point between a certain interval, like AB, we can say it is continuous on the interval AB. So let's say if F is continuous at every point between A and B then F is continuous on A, B, the open interval. If S continuous at every point, that means like, like over here between this range of numbers, it's continuous at every single point, right? There's no jumps, there's no holes, there's no asymptotes, it is continuous. We'd say it's, it's continuous on the open interval. The question I have is, what about the endpoints? And we're going to look at that right now. So what would happen, because right now the, this is open, right? It's not including the A and the B. How can we determine whether or not to include those endpoints with brackets or, or whether we can't? And we'll look at that just briefly. So F is continuous at every point, okay? We have F is continuous on the interval A B. But what about the endpoints?
And let's say this is our function path. Hey, would you say this function is continuous between A and B without including the endpoints? Mm -hmm. For sure, at every single point. There's, there's nothing wrong with it. Now, would you say it's continuous at the point B? Yeah, the point's there, right? The point's there. Now, we don't have, here, here's a weird thing, we don't have a full-on limit because we don't even have one side. However, the one-sided limit from the left goes to the same value that the point B is defined at. Does that make sense to you? So it's going to the point and the point exists. You with me? How about the left-hand side? Does the limit, I'm sorry, is it continuous at the point A? At the point A. The limit exists from the right, sure. The point exists, but is the limit equal to the point? No. Then no, this would be kind of like a jump, right? If I, if I had this going this way, that would be like a jump continuity. You have that, that point that's not there. Uh, now, it's, it doesn't have that other side. So we'd say this is continuous on, well, how would we write that? If it's continuous from A to B, but it includes B and not A, how, how do I write that? One bracket, one parenthesis, sure. So this is continuous on, I know it goes from A to B. Again, does it include the B? The B. The B, yes, because the point's there, the limit's there, it equals the same thing. How do I show that? Is that the bracket or the parentheses? That's the bracket. That says I include the point B. Now, it can't include the point A because the limit exists from one side. Uh huh. The point is there, sure, but it's not the same. In general, here's what you have. I'll give you a more mathematical definition of this. In general. Here's what has to happen. If it's con it has to be continuous from the left at point C or continuous from the right at point C. So for continuity from the left, have the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x has to equal f of c. That's very, very similar to the third qualification for continuity that we just had, only this time it's a one-sided limit. So basically we're just checking one-sided limits and making sure they, they go to the point that is defined and that the point is actually defined. This is like the situation we have at point b, okay? The limit from the left exists. The function at C, well, in this case that's B, okay? The limit at the, uh, the function at the point exists and they are equal. This is like the situation for point B. Like point B. For being continuous to the other endpoint from the right, It's just the opposite limit. You have to have the limit from the right-hand side. The function has to be defined at that point, and it's got to be the same. This is like f of a. The limit has to exist. It does. The point has to be defined. It is, but they would have to be identical. So this is like the, the point A situation. In our case, it's not continuous at the point A. Would you like to see an example on how to prove this with a, a closed interval? Okay, I'll, I'll show you how to do this. It's a three-part, it's not hard, okay, it's just a three-part proof. What we're going to do is we're going to prove continuity for an open interval, which is relatively easy. We're going to prove continuity for the left and the right intervals, which are both relatively easy. So we have basically three limits to do. We, we've got to prove continuity in the middle, then prove continuity at the end points. So I'll write the question on the board and then we'll, we'll go for that.
So I want to prove that this function is continuous on negative 4 to 4. Inclusive, close interval. This again involves three parts. The first step, we've got to check the open interval. Got to check the open interval. The next step is going to be check the right endpoint. The next step is going to be check the left endpoint. So I'll write these out and we'll, we'll start here next time. So the right endpoint would be positive 4 from the left. The left endpoint would be negative 4 from the right. So you're going from the right on that. We'll figure out how to do this next time. I'll show you each little piece of this, and we'll determine that it is, in fact, continuous from negative 4 to 4 inclusively. All right, so hopefully you remember from last time we were working on this problem. We want to prove that that particular function is continuous on a closed interval. Now, in order to, to figure out if a function is continuous on a closed interval, we have to basically check three things. We've got to check first the open interval to see if there's any holes or asymptotes on that open interval. The endpoint's a little different, though, because when we check continuity, we're really checking limits, right? Right? Yeah. So we're checking limits. And at an endpoint, a full-on limit does not exist because there is no function coming from the left or, the, or maybe the right-hand side at a certain case. So what we do at our endpoints is we check a one-sided limit. So what that means is that, sure, we can check the limit on an open interval just fine because there's always a point to the right. That means that we can always find the limit of that. However, when we talk about endpoints, we've got to check one-sided limits and just see if they match up. Now, it's not a hard thing, so, so don't think it's going to be super, super hard. It's just you have to do it three points to actually prove it right. You okay on that? I'll show you how to do it. You'll see it. it's not really a hard, hard thing to do. Uh, first thing we're going to do is check the open interval, negative 4, 4. So we're going to check this thing to say that, okay, at least we know we're continuous from this point to this point, but not inclusively. Then we'll have to check the endpoint, negative 4, and we'll check the endpoint, positive 4. If we're going to check, I want you to understand the notation here. If we're going to check negative 4, understand that negative 4, we're going to have to be coming from the right to check that. Do you understand that? Because from the left, nothing exists over here. So we have to be coming from the right. Does that make sense? For positive 4, that's over here. We're going to have to be coming from the left. That's where this from the left and from the right are coming from. There is nothing to check over here, it's from the left-hand side. There's, we're, we're saying the function we care about the other side of that. Do you understand the notation for our limits? All right, so let's do the open interval. I'll show you how to do this. It's really just a, a very, very basic point uh, proof. Here's how you start out. What we want to prove is that the limit of f of x equals f of c as x approaches c. That's what we want. If we can show that, then we've proved that the limit exists, the function exists, and they equal each other. That will prove the whole thing. That, that will be the three cases for continuity, or the three points for continuity. The limit exists, the function exists, and they equal each other. You with me on that? So let's do that. What we're going to do is start here and try to work our way to there. So the limit as x approaches c of f of x is really the same thing as the limit as x approaches c of the square root of 16 minus x squared. Are you okay with that so far? Now, given that c is some point between negative 4 and 4, given that c is some point between negative 4 and 4, can we plug in C and be okay? What do you think? Let's say C was 5. Would that be okay? 
you'd have a negative inside your square root, right? That would be a problem. But because c is between negative 4 and 4, are we going to have a negative inside of our square root? Okay, so what we can say is that if c is between negative 4 and 4 for any c, then this is possible. Here's where you make the jump. If there's not going to be any issues in your specified open interval, open domain, then you can make the jump and say, okay, we can actually evaluate that limit at any point c. Do you believe me? If I gave you any point between negative 4 and 4, could you plug it in and be okay? Absolutely. Here's what that says. It says, if Mr. Leonard gives me any point, I could plug it in and be okay. Where'd the C come from? It's not a trick question. Where'd the C come from? Yeah. Where's X approaching? And you know for a fact that C is between these numbers, right? That's what I'm, I'm telling you here. And you just told me that no matter what I gave you between there, i.e. C, no matter what I gave you, you could plug it in, right? That's what you're saying here. You're saying the limit is okay to evaluate because this is between those numbers. I have no problems. Now check this out. Is this not F of C? Isn't that just F evaluated at C? You've just proved it. We've just proved that the limit of f of x as x approach c equals f of c. We've proved that. That's checked for that. That's all you got to do. Just make sure you take that, plug in the c, and see that's exactly the same. You okay with that one so far? I hope so. It's not, you might think, well, that's kind of trivial. It's really not trivial. I mean, we're, we're actually thinking whether this point's in there. Sure. We're thinking whether it's going to have any problems. It doesn't. Therefore, we can take any c, plug it in. And that is f of c. That's what we're trying to prove. We're trying to get to this point. So that does it for us. Now, as far as the one side limits go, as far as that goes, if we're going to the right, or sorry, from the right to negative 4, we're getting really, really, really close to negative 4. Would it be OK if I just plugged in negative 4? Is, what's 16 minus negative 4 squared? Is that okay? Can you get a 0 inside of a square root? Is that acceptable? Yeah. Yeah. Then yeah, that, that's a one side limit. That's going to exist as well. So this, well this is going to equal 0. That's equal 0. You're going to plug, well I, I can show you the extra step if you want. You said it's okay to even evaluate that at 4. It exists. The limit's going to exist one-sidedly from, from the right. That's the same thing as saying, oh, well, that's 16 of negative, sorry, minus negative 4 squared. That equals 0, which equals f of negative 4. Because you're just plugging it in. That's also saying the limit as x approaches a certain number, in this case an endpoint, is equal to the function's value at that point. That's another check. We can do exactly the same thing for 4 to the right. If you plug in positive 4, is that going to have an issue over here? No, that means that as we get closer and closer to positive 4, this function's getting closer and closer to 0. True? So we can plug that in, that the one side limit's going to exist. It says it's going to that value. So this would be, well, square root of 16 minus 4 squared, which is 0, which is exactly f of 4. That's what you're trying to prove. You're trying to prove that I can plug in any number, that's what that says, and it equals the function at that value. So that I can plug in the endpoint. Look at this is what this says. I can plug in the endpoint, and it gives me f of when I plug in the endpoint. That's all I'm saying. I can plug in the endpoint. And it gives me f of when I can plug in the endpoint. What this says in general is, okay, the limits exist in all cases, one-sidedly and in general, and the limits equal the functions at every single value. If that happens, you're continuous the whole way through, not just on the open interval, but now on the closed interval because you included endpoints. And that's how you check it. Did that make sense to you? Were you able to follow that? Mm -hmm. It might seem a little confusing. Why, why do we do this? Well, you kind of have to do it that way. You have to check a one side limit because you can't technically do this for the whole thing because you don't have um, you don't have a limit at every single point. You have a full on limit from both sides at every point. You have it here, but you don't have it here. That's the difference. That's why you have to check it.
Now, a couple properties about limits that we're going to discuss. Were there any questions on that, by the way? As my back is turned to you so I can't see you, raise your hand. <laughs> uh, any questions? Seriously. All right, then. A couple properties. Let's say that we got two functions, f and g, and both are continuous um, at a certain point. If f and g are continuous at a certain point, then all of the following statements are true. Firstly, if f and g are both continuous, f plus g must also be continuous. f minus g must also be continuous. f times g is continuous at that point at that specific point. So if f's continuous and g is continuous at a certain point, then we can do f plus g, f minus g, and f times g, and they're all continuous at that exact same point. Does that make sense to you? What, where it wouldn't be the case is, let's say that f was continuous, but g wasn't continuous at a certain point. If you add them, well, then g is still not continuous there, right, no matter what you do. So that wouldn't work. The other one is, well, you probably figured out, but f over g. Now, I'll say this. f over g is continuous at c. Unless what happens? G of x equals zero. Sure. Zero. G of c, actually. G of c. Because we're talking about at the point c, right? If g of c equals zero. If, the, if c, uh, when, you, when you take a limit uh, of g and as you're approaching c, if that goes to zero, well, then you're divided by zero, and you can't have that. So it is continuous at c unless g of c equals zero. And then you'd have a problem. If it does, because we're going to see this in just a moment, if g of c does equal 0, what does that tell you about your, your function? Firstly, is it continuous? Mm -hmm. Secondly, there are two, oh now I hope, you, I hope you remember this, there were two cases when you divided by 0. There was two cases of what you could have. Name one. A whole or asymptote. asymptote. So, if g of c does equal 0, there is a discontinuity at C. There's a discontinuity at C. Of course, we're speaking just of this, though, okay? F would be continuous and G would be continuous, but F over G there would be a discontinuity at C for f over g, for that uh, division of those two functions. Are you guys okay with that, that all these are okay except for this one? And if this is the case, if g of c does equal zero, then we have a discontinuity, and that's either a whole or an asymptote. Do you remember that? I'm going to actually define that for you later and give you the, the notes on that. We've just kind of spoken about it. I wanted to preview it so that way when you got here, it was like, oh, yeah, that's easy. We're going to talk about that. So it's going to be very easy in just a moment. You're like, yes, I get this because we already talked about it. But before I do that, uh, I do have to talk about one more thing. It's going to be kind of interesting to you. Scott? So just to recap. Um, it wasn't on this, right? No. Oh, good. Because this just, is getting uh, nice. If, zero, if it's 0 over 0 uh -huh. and it's an asymptote, no, no, no. We're going to talk about that right now. Okay. Well, not right now. Later. We're going to talk about that in uh, <laughs> three and a half minutes, okay. roughly. <laughs> not roughly. <laughs> exactly. 
Do you remember that if a function is continuous at any point C, I hope you remember because we just talked about it. If a function is continuous at C, here's what we know. The limit of the function as x approaches C equals not C, f of C, yes. Does that look familiar to you? That was the definition of, of continuity right there. It said this exists, this exists, and they equal each other. Remember that? That was number three. So this is our definition of continuity. If we're continuous at any point C, then that has to take place. But I want to refresh your memory on something. Do you remember what could happen for a, polynom a polynomial when we first introduced limits? I did this. I, I gave you the properties. I worked through a specific polynomial. And I said, hey, can we do this for every polynomial? You're like, yeah, this is awesome. I'm like, yeah, I know, right? And you're like, yeah, that's cool. Do you remember? Do you remember? <laughs> Let me even make it easier. Make it a C for any, any point. Do you remember what you can do to find the limit of a polynomial? Does it involve a lot of work? Just plug it in. You just plug it in, which means in this case, if I'm trying to find the limit of a polynomial, so P of X is a polynomial, you just plug it in. So what would the limit of a polynomial be as X approaches C? What would it be? P of C. Very good. Oops. This is interesting. I've just proved something for you in kind of a simple way. It's kind of nice. Do you see that this looks a whole lot like that? This was the definition of continuity, right? Yep. This we know we could do for any polynomial. True? What this says is that every polynomial is continuous everywhere. This is always the case. So we just proved that every polynomial is always continuous. Isn't that interesting? Every polynomial. That means everything like uh, 3x squared minus 2x plus 4. Guarantee it's, it's continuous. It's polynomial. As long as it doesn't have square roots, because that's not a polynomial. Negative exponents, because that's not a polynomial. Uh, fractional exponents, because those are, again, those are roots. Right? It's not a polynomial. As long as it just has those, those positive exponents to it and there's no fractions, it's continuous. That's what a polynomial is. This says that every polynomial is continuous. That's kind of cool. So what this says is <coughs> any polynomial is continuous anywhere. statement. Every polynomial is continuous everywhere. If we combine this idea with this idea, check it out. Combine this idea, every polynomial is continuous, with this idea of this is always going to be continuous provided that g is not zero. What that means is that every rational function will be continuous everywhere except where the denominator is equal to zero. Because a rational function is a polynomial over polynomial. Do you buy into that? So it says polynomials are always continuous. Rational functions are always continuous unless the denominator equals zero. That's what these two statements say together. So a rational function which is like P of X over Q of X, where these are both polynomials. is continuous everywhere except It's 
continuous everywhere, except where the denominator could be equal to zero. In other words, where this happens. At that point, you're going to have a discontinuity. That's what we said, right? If the denominator is equal to zero, you will have a discontinuity at that point. What I've already told you is that that point will either be a hole or an asymptote. Remember that? That's the two things we could have. So we were starting to put everything together. Polynomials, always continuous. We just proved it with our limit. Uh, rational functions, always continuous, except where this happens, because we, can know, we know that we can take, look at that, two continuous functions. If it's rational, that means they're both continuous because it's a polynomial of a polynomial. That satisfies that. They're both continuous everywhere. If you take it, this will also be continuous unless the denominator is zero. And that's all I'm saying here. Is except for the denominator equals zero, at that point, you will have a discontinuity, either a whole or an asymptote. That's typically, this is 95% of the time, what happens with holes and asymptotes. Now, we've, we've seen a case where this didn't work. Okay, we already saw that where we had 0 over 0. If you have 0 over 0, you can typically factor, well, you will always be able to factor, uh, well, typically, unless you're dealing with like a trig function. But if you are dealing with rational, okay, let, let's just stick with rational for right now. If you have this and it's rational, you will be able to factor it. You will be able to cross something out. That will happen here if it's a rational function. I'm not saying square roots. I'm not saying uh, weird exponents. I'm saying polynomial over polynomial. Do you understand the difference there? That will happen. Now, does it always take care of every problem? No, we already saw that it didn't, but it's a good place to start. If you have this and you cross it out, that's typically a whole. All right, that's typically what happens. If you cross it out and you still have this, where you have a number over zero, a number over zero, that says you can't cross it out you're going to have an asymptote there. That's typically what happens here. Some expression over zero. You with me on that one? No. You said C over constant. zero. Constant. That would be the constant. Some constant. Oh, just any number. OK. Some constant. Because when you evaluate the limit, right, you plug in a number for it. Yeah. If you have a number over zero, it's probably an asymptote. 95%, okay? Every time, I don't know. 95%, that's what happens. Would you like to try a couple examples? Yes, sir. <laughs> of course you would. Math class. <laughs> Have you understood everything we've talked about so far? I think so. Okay. Examples help. Well, yeah. Small examples tell us that we're really lost in that. <laughs> True. I'm thinking probably not. do with this problem is I want to find any discontinuities tell me what you know about discontinuities with a rational function like this one. Tell me what you know about discontinuities. Where do they occur? Yeah, 
when the what equals zero, the numerator or denominator? Denominator, denominator equals zero. So how are we going to find discontinuities for rational functions? Sure. Set equals zero, that's going to involve some factoring, absolutely. Essentially, all you're doing is finding domain. Remember finding domain? Well, we had problems with domain. We already really covered this. When you cover domain, you basically cover where your function is not continuous. We're just doing it for real now, talking about continuity. So you've already basically done that. If you set your denominator not equal to zero and solve it down, you're going to find out those points that you cannot have. So uh, what, however you choose to do that, you need to find your discontinuity. So if we set our denominator equal to zero, what that's going to tell you is where you are not continuous at. The points at which you are not continuous. How about that? It's better English. Better English. Can you factor that? Jeez, I sure hope so. I really do. Did you get 2 and negative 3 as well? Yes. Now, I want you to go one step further. I want you to identify whether those things are holes, or whether those things are asymptotes. And here's the way you can do that. Factor both the numerator and denominator as much as you can. All right? Or plug in the, why don't you plug in the number, uh, plug, in, plug in one of those numbers and see what you get. You can do it that way too. But if you factor as much as you can, what you're going to get is x plus 2, x minus 2, all over x plus 3, x minus 2. You with me on that one? Now, you need to get both discon all the discontinuities first before you start crossing stuff out. Are you ever going to be able to cross out a discontinuity and just eliminate the discontinuity? We learned that from domain, right? You can't ever just cross out a domain issue and then say, my domain's fine. No, you can't do that, right? You still have to write it down. So, firstly, write down where your, where your discontinuities are. So, discontinuities. at x equals 3, sorry, negative 3, and x equals 2. This will tell you which is which. That will tell you which is which. Uh, which one can you cross out, the 2 or the negative 3? The 2. If you can cross it out, what does that tell you about the discontinuity at x equals 2? That's a whole. If you can cross it out, that means the function goes like this, and then it just it misses that one point and continues. So this thing, that's how you find it out. If you crossed out the discontinuity, you can't ever get rid of it. But if you're able to factor it out, that's a whole. Tell me something. You're completely factored, right? Can you cross out the x plus 3 at all? So what does it tell you about the, the discontinuity that occurs right there? That's an asymptote, and that's how you determine it. No, it's not hard. It's factoring and crossing stuff out. What you cross out is called a whole. What you don't cross out is called an asymptote. At least for rational functions, that's the way it works. I'm not going to give you another example because I think that's pretty straightforward. Is that pretty straightforward? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, let's go ahead and let's prove something here real quick. Let's prove that the absolute value of x is continuous everywhere. Now, <coughs> can you picture the absolute value of x in your head? Yeah. Is it continuous everywhere? Do you ever pick your pencil up? No. Then it's continuous everywhere. That's what graphically it means. Let's figure out how to prove that. It's going to be similar to um, one of some of our one side limits we've already worked with. Is absolute value of x continuous everywhere? And you go, let's see, looks like this. Yep, done. No, we can't do that. There's not proof. That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, here's how to prove it with some, some limits, okay? What we want to prove for continuity, that was pretty funny, I like that, uh, is that the, the limit exists at every point, that the limit equals the function value at every point, and that even at that weird place where it comes together, that, that exists. So here's how we're going to define it, all right? We're going to define absolute value of x in, a, in an interesting way. We're going to say that absolute value of x, you already know this one. It's x and it's negative x. In fact, I think we could probably do that too. But this will make it even more interesting. For x is bigger than 0, for x is less than 0, let's make it 0 for x equals 0. The reason why. The reason why this looks funny to you and why I don't have an equality here is because, do you remember what we ran into with limits as far as checking the endpoints? Do you remember we ran into limit? There is no limit at an endpoint. You have to check the endpoints themselves, right? So we would run into this situation anyway. If I had an equal sign, that would dictate an actual endpoint. You follow me on that? So what I'm saying is that that's basically an open interval. We can check that with our knowledge of polynomials and, and continuity, no problem. Same thing with this one, that we'll have to check with one-sided limits. So here's what we know. Is this a polynomial? Yeah. Sure, it's the most simple polynomial. Well, besides a constant, that's like the most simple polynomial you can have, right? Just x. Are polynomials continuous everywhere? Mm -hmm. Then this is continuous everywhere. It's a polynomial. What that means is continuous. Hey, is this a polynomial? Sure. That means it's continuous. Now, this is that is, well, technically a polynomial, right? That's, that's just a one, but it's one single point. This is the point zero. So when you get zero, it gives you zero. That's the where you come together on your, your absolute value. What we need to check is only this. We need to check that the one-sided limit of this one equals zero, and the one-sided limit of this one equals zero. That's what we can check. If we can prove that, then we know that that's continuous everywhere. The limit of this equals zero, the limit of this equals zero, the function is defined at zero, therefore all three pieces come together. Do you see what we're trying to do here? If you don't, then I need to know. Yes or no? Some people are just looking yes or no? Okay. Sometimes I say I get, I get. <laughs> During the headlights. Yes, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if I have a lazy eye and it's like looking and you think, is he looking? <laughs> I had a teacher with a lazy eye once. It was one of my questions. It'd be like this. I'd be like looking at you. And then you're like, yeah, yeah, I get it. And then she would switch it. <laughs> yeah, that was great. I, I, she had fun with it, though. She really did. She had fun with it. Good lady. <laughs> Okay. Or man, I'm not naming names, so she had a teacher yeah. once. <laughs> All right, so uh, <clears throat> let's go ahead and do this. We're going to check this, the limit as x approaches 0 from the right. Look at, look at what we're doing. x is positive, right? So from the right for x. From the left for negative x. And we'll see what each of these things are. So, from the right hand side, where does x go from the right hand side as you approach zero? It goes to zero. It's a polynomial. You can plug it in. It's going to zero. Where does negative x go as you approach zero from the left? Does it also go to zero? Goes to zero. That checks it right there. It says that the limit, the one side limit exists. This limit clearly exists. It's continuous. Uh, this limit is exists. It says going to the point that is also defined. It says the limits exist. The point exists, and they all equal each other. That means that you're continuous everywhere, and that's how you prove it.
Okay, we've got to move on for a little bit. What right, right now we're going to talk about is something to do with compositions and how we can use compositions up very much to our benefit in functions. Now stick with me here. We're kind of proving stuff today if you haven't noticed. Let's say <coughs> that there's a certain function that as x approaches some number, we'll call it c, the limit definitely exists, and we'll call it l. And let's also say there's another function f, and it's continuous at l. Well, then check this out. We're going to find out right now what happens when we compose g onto f, or f of g in other words. So what happens if we take the limit as x approaches c of f of g of x? A composition. You guys have seen compositions like that before, yeah? Well. This is kind of interesting, just check, check it out for a minute. Would you agree that if the limit exists, if the limit exists, then the limit of g of x as x approaches c is equal to the limit, yes, but it's also equal to g of c, right? So then as we're <coughs> plugging in c, this is, this is g of c, but that's also equal to the limit. So this equals, so that's the same thing as f of l. Reason I, I, I had the extra limit in there, I, I don't need that. Uh, so, if x approaches c, then g of x approaches l. You, you with me on that one? I had the extra limit, I didn't need it. Uh, if, if g of x approaches l, and f is continuous at l, then we know if f is continuous, we can just plug that number in, this is going to be equal to f of l. Now, the cool thing is we'll make a substitution right here. And we'll say, all right, well then, we can do f of, how much is l equal to? Not just g of x. G of x is approaching c. The G's limit c. of g of x. As x approaches c. What that proves to you is you can separate limits by composition. So this says, look at that. This is a composition of f of g of x. We can pull the f outside of the outside of the limit. We can take the limit of the g of x mm -hmm. and then apply the function. That's really interesting. Yeah. F has to be continuous at L because when you compose that, you're actually not plugging C into F. You're plugging L into F. Does that make sense? You're plugging C into G. The, the limit of G as X approaches C gives you L. You're taking that L, you plug it into F. Since F is continuous at L, you can make this jump. To say, if I plug in the C, that's going to go to L. If I plug in the L right here, that's going to go to F of L because it's continuous. You with me on that one? Since that happens, we can make that jump and say, oh, but wait, L is equal to the limit of G of X as X approaches C. And that proves our composition for us. Say we can separate limits by composition. So this says right here, we can separate limits by composition. Let me give you a quick example of how we can do this, how we can use it. Talk about maybe one more thing that we have for today. So, a quick example. Let's say we have a limit as x approaches 4 of the absolute value 10 minus 3x squared. 
here's basically what this says we can do. Do you understand how this really is a composition of one function and the absolute value function? Do you guys see that? What it says is that you can treat this, because we, don't, we haven't really defined uh, limits of absolute value. We haven't really talked about that. We've had to do one side limits for things like this so far. So if we haven't really talked about it, there's something that we actually can do here. This says, well, well, wait, if that's a composition, then this means, since we've proved absolute value of x, is, this is why we had to do it, why you're like, why didn't we use it here? We've already proved absolute value of x is continuous everywhere. Are you with me? And for this function to work, for this, con for this uh, composition to work, f had to be continuous at, every, at a point. Well, it's continuous at all points, therefore we can do the composition. Do you see the difference there? We couldn't use it here because that would be circular. But we had to prove it once. We proved it. Now we can use it for absolute value. Say, oh, well, well, wait, that's a composition of a function that's continuous everywhere. I can pull that outside. If you remember, uh, I hope you do. You remember? You remember. Remember? Well, I actually did that with cosine before. Remember me doing that with cosine? The reason why we could do it is because cosine is continuous everywhere. And now I've proved it for compositions. We used it earlier, but I've proved it now that we can, in fact, do that. So we say take a limit of this and then take the absolute value, and that will work just fine for you. You can separate limits by composition. What's the limit of 10 minus 3x squared as we approach 4? Don't all speak at once. Negative 38? Negative 38? No, 38. 38. Wait, inside. Oh, so this says you'll have the absolute value of negative 38 because the limit of 10 minus 3x squared is it's polynomial. You plug in the number, you get negative 38. Then we take the absolute value of negative 38, we get, and that's our answer. So the limit would be 38. A couple of notes before we go. Um, if two functions are continuous everywhere, their composition will be continuous everywhere. So absolute value can be considered two functions? Absolute value with any, anything inside it can be considered a composition. <coughs> Functions are continuous everywhere. Their composition is continuous everywhere. And it's for this reason. If this always works, if this always continuous, and that's always continuous, and you can close them any, any way you want, it's still going to be continuous. One last thing about inverses. We haven't spoken about them yet. We will just briefly. If f is continuous on its domain, then f inverse will be continuous on its domain. But remember that with inverses, the domain of an inverse is the range of your original function. So if f is continuous on its domain, f inverse, the inverse of f, will also be continuous on its respective domain but keep in mind that the domain of f inverse is the range of your original function. You switch x and y, right? So the range becomes domain, domain becomes range. So if f is continuous on its domain, f inverse will also be continuous <coughs> on its respective domain, but that is the range of your original function, the range of f. Okay, in the last minute that we have, let me give you one quick example.
let's just say f of x is x cubed. Uh, is x cubed a polynomial? Yes. That means it's continuous everywhere. So it's continuous on the entire domain, uh, the entire real number system. So it's a polynomial. It's continuous on negative infinity to infinity. It's range. What's its range? What's its range? Oh, not just that. It also goes from negative infinity to infinity. Yeah, all real numbers. So if we found the inverse, do you remember how to find the inverse? Yeah, you, well, you make y equals x cubed. You switch your variables. x equals y cubed. You solve for your y, the cube root of x equals y, and therefore f inverse of x equals the cube root of x. Here's what, that's cube root. Here's what I know about this already. I, I, don't, I, I know that for a fact, because this is the inverse of this polynomial, I don't have to do any more work with it. I guarantee you that that's continuous on the range of my original function. So because the range of my function was negative infinity to infinity, not the domain, not really concerned about that. That's a polynomial, it's continuous everywhere. But my range was negative infinity to infinity. What this says is that this must be continuous from negative infinity to infinity, continuous everywhere. If the range is everything, the inverse function has a domain of everything. So it's continuous because of the range, negative infinity to infinity. Well, good afternoon. Welcome back. We're going to continue talking just a little bit about some limits. Uh, one application of, of these, uh, of, well, and continuity. One application of continuity we're going to talk about today is something called the intermediate value theorem. Now, here's the idea. Let's say that I gave you... some continuous function. So, so it's, it's definitely a function. f of x. And I say this function is defined between a and b. Or let's just put some endpoints on it. a to b. Can you tell me how high is this point? It would be certainly y, but let's not make it in terms of y. Let's make it in terms of f. How high would that point be? f of a, f of a is a good start. Well, that, that, that'd be what, how high it would be. So if this is a, how do you figure the height out as you plug that into your function, right? Or in other words, f of a. Cool. How high is this point? f of b. All right. Well, let's follow the pattern there. So <laughs> f of a, f of b, very good. That gives us our heights. Now here's the question. Firstly, let me say that f is certainly continuous. Do you see that f is continuous on the interval a, b? So f of x is continuous. In fact, since it has those endpoints, we could say it's continuous on the closed interval as well. Here's my question. Let's suppose that I picked some random point, some arbitrary point between f of a, some arbitrary value between f of a and f of b. Let, maybe like here. And I'll call it k. So let's say that k is between f of a and f of b. Here's my question. If I find the, the input that gives me this output, if I can find the input that gives me that output, will it be between A and B? That's the question. If F is <coughs> continuous, here's what it says. It says if you give me any point, any value between F of A and F of B, something in here, I can guarantee you that the input that would give me that value lies between A and B. And here's how we say this is the intermediate value theorem. It says, uh, for any value k, 
for any value k, there's at least one point, at least one value between a and b that will give you that, the function of that value gives you k. So in other words, um, if k is between f of a and f of b, then there's at least one x value At least, there could be more. If you if you don't have a one-to-one -one function, you could have several. There's at least one number let me call it C, okay? At least one number, we'll call it C such that F of C will give you K. I need to add one little part of here. Uh, there's at least one number C where C is between, that's kind of a key point, where C is between <coughs> A and B. equals k. You want to hear it in plain English because that's kind of mathy, right? It says, well, say k is between f of a and f of b, then there's at least one number c where c is between a and b and f of c equals k. Now that makes perfect sense to me, but here's what it says in English for you if you're like, oh yeah, I don't understand this. Here's what it says. If you give me any, if, you're, if your function's continuous, that means there's no holes, there's no asymptotes, there's no jumps. You get, you get me? It's a smooth curve. Uh, if, if, you're, if you give me an output between these numbers, my input will be between these numbers. So here's my input and my output, right, for those, those respective values. Here's my input and my output. It says you give me an output anywhere in this range, the input must be somewhere between this range. And there's going to be at least one such that this input gives you that output. Could you pick a different point? Sure. You can pick any one of these points, but no matter what, that output is going to be mapped to at least one input. At least one. Now, if you did a curve like this where you, where you had that, you could have more than one, right? One, two, three, however many you wanted. Uh, you could definitely do that. If it's continuous, you'll have at least one, though. How many people understand the idea of that? And that's called the intermediate value theorem. Do you want to see kind of a cool application for this? Yes. I'm excited about it. I hope you're excited about it. You want to see? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Here's a cool uh, application. You can actually approximate roots. You know what roots are, right? Where functions cross the x-axis. You can approximate that with this idea. Here's the, the plan. Let's say that I have this, this certain function. Um, it looks like that, though. Well, of course, this height is f of b, and that height's f of a. Here's the idea using the intermediate value theorem. You know for a fact, for a fact, that this was true, right? If I give you some specific value here, you can find me an input in this range such that that gives me that output. Are you with me on that? You can give me any specific output that you want to, and I can find you the input that's in this range. Do you understand that? Here's what it says for this. It says, let's suppose that you know that f of a is positive and f of b is negative. So in other words, the signs are different. If the signs are different, then what you know for sure is that it crosses the x-axis, right? 
In other words, it says that if I say, find me the point of zero, that's an intermediate value right there, right? It's between those values. If I say, find me the, the input that gives me zero, we, we need to, or we know for sure that that actually exists. If our signs are different, then of course we cross the x-axis, right? And according to the intermediate value theorem, it says, well, you're continuous, right? Your signs are, are different. So if we're going from positive to negative according to our, our interval of outputs, then zero's got to be between those because we went from positive to negative. So I can, I can say with certainty, according to the intermediate value theorem, that there is going to be an input such that f of that input will give me an output of zero. Let me write some of that out for you so that you have that. It says that if your signs are different, f of a and f of b have different signs. If you ever thought about two things having different signs, then you know zero will be between those two numbers, true? If I say uh, negative anything and positive anything, you know that zero is between them, yes? If zero is between them, that means you're, you can apply the intermediate value theorem. If zero is between them, then you must have a certain input that will give you zero. That's applied uh, using the intermediate intermediate value theorem applied to this case. So, it says if the signs are different, there must be at least one root on that closed interval. And that's all that says. It's just a very specific case where your signs are different, you know zero is between them. You can say for any output, you can give me a specific input on that, on that uh, domain, on that interval. Would you like to see it in, in application how you would actually do this? <clears throat> now, of course, we have calculators, right? You just go, oh, let me use my zero button for my graphing, and we'll do it very, very fast. Well, let's say that all calculators broke. Isn't that an interesting idea? What if they all broke, which they're not going to? But if they did, you could, you could now do it. Here's the example. I'll give you this function. I'll just explain very quickly uh, the idea. You'd find some, some point on this graph. Uh, I, I know for, for sure that I don't really know exactly how this graph looks, but I know for sure it's continuous everywhere. Can you explain to me why this is continuous everywhere? Very good. So this is definitely going to be continuous on any closed interval. So I know this graph looks something like that. All right? I know for sure. It goes forever. Well, here's the deal. I'd plug in some numbers at some point, and what I would find is that when I plugged in 1 and when I plugged in 2, they had different signs. For instance, f of 2 was up here f of 1 was down here. That means that somewhere between 1 and 2, according to the intermediate value theorem as used for approximating roots, I know that I'm going to have some number that gives me a 0 there. Does that make sense to you? I know it's going to be within that range because all well, my signs are different. So here's how you go about doing that. You would make yourself up a table, x, y, and what you do is you have every every value between 1 and 2 according to like a tenth or something. So like 1.0 1. 1, uh, and 1.1, 1. 1. 1. 1.2, 1. 1.3, 1. 1.4, and so on. And what, it, this is a very time consuming. Okay? You're, you're not going to do this all the time. You're going to use your, your calculator, of course. But this is how you would do it. I'm just giving you the how. Am I expecting you to do this all the time? No, heck no. But this is how it would work according to our, our theorem over here. What you do is you take all these numbers and you would plug them into that function. You're going to get a negative, a negative, a negative, but somewhere it's going to change to a positive. Are you with me? It's saying like, here it's negative, here it's negative, here's, but somewhere, somewhere over here it's going to change to a positive. And I think if I've done this right, it's between 1.3 and 1.4. So this would be negative, 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 
negative, positive. Positive, positive. Right here, well, you've just narrowed the range. Right now, you know that the root has to be between 1.3 and 1.4. Do you see why we use the same idea? We just can't make it smaller. So you take that and you go, okay, let's try this again. X, Y, and you start now with 1.30. 1.31, 1.32, and you'd continue that. And then you'd find out which one of those is negative and, and where the breakoff is to where it becomes positive. Do you see how you can get very accurate with this? You can get to however many decimal places you want. Already I know it's going to be 1.3 something, and then I would do this one. I'd find out it's 1.3 something. So I could find out all those numbers as, as much as I want, as accurate as I want to be. And that's one way you can actually set up a computer program to do that for you. Program a calculator that would that would do that for you. It might take a little bit of time, but it's possible. How many people understood the idea of, of applying that? All right, good deal. So just a little kind of nice something we can use there.